is that time in May when people start talking about that movie from the 80s, the one with uh, James Earl Jones as the villain, came out in May 1982. That's right. Once again, we must ask Conan, what is best in DevOps? To crush CICDs, to see supply chains before you, and to hear the attestation of their S bomb. Which means, this week we talk with Ray Bango from Veracode about why developers need to think differently about software security and how developer background can inform security thinking. In the news segment, bad Alec bugs make faith in IoT disturbing. A gatekeeper bypass is all too easy. Kerberos flaws are altering the deal. A new Spectre style attack is impressive, most impressive. And more, alert your star destroyers and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Cloud Native Development presents new challenges for security teams. Ephemeral workloads are scattered across services, and it's hard to identify resources, monitor configurations, and ensure compliance. Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks is a comprehensive cloud native security platform, delivering full stack protection for multi and hybrid cloud environments. It provides deep visibility, threat detection, and data security, as well as protection for hosts, containers, and serverless while enforcing policy guardrails. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Prisma Cloud to gain control over your cloud security. This is episode 149, recorded May 3rd, 2021. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Hey there, happy Monday, how are you? Happy Monday, doing well. And I'm also curious if anyone has a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows. Submit your suggestions for guests by completing the form at securityweekly.com slash guests. We read suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Our next you know, Mike, technical uh, track. Uh, Mike, I'm going to interrupt for a second. You know, I'm a little biased on this, but I just <laughs> would love to see Weld Pond on, on the podcast. Just, just saying, you know, just a little biased. There we go. Prison. We've got foreshadowing from who our guest is foreshadowing another guest so we're going to have to take that note <laughs> so uh weld pond coming up but also ray hang in there because you have to find mm -hmm. out about our next technical training that's going to be on may revenge of the sixth at 11 a.m eastern mm -hmm. it's going to explore common misconfigurations of nginx the damage they could do and how to avoid them after that see how attackers gain access to endpoints and learn defensive strategies to protect against those attacks in our may 13th technical training also at 11 a.m. Eastern. Register now at securityweekly.com slash webcasts. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they're available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com slash on demand. And as our listeners just heard, we have Ray here with us, who, who is a security practitioner and tinkerer. After spending nearly 30 years in software development, he got the crazy idea to switch to security. Ha, the fool. Now he focuses <laughs> on helping developers build more secure software at Veracode with some people like Weld Pond. Uh, hello, Ray. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And you said that so well. I mean, you, you, you teed me up so nicely. And yeah. I, I can't believe I switched into security. I was doing so great in software development and got this crazy idea that security was a thing. And yeah, I found out real quick that it's a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. And I, I want to yeah. dive into, you know, developers thinking about security, but let's actually rewind a little bit and t talk about y your background as a developer. You s must have spent quite a long time there. And um, but before, you know, what was t tell us a bit about that development background? You know, how were you exposed to security during that time? And what made you jump the, the fence, so to speak, or just cross over onto the security side of things? Sure. So uh, my first job was in 1989. And back then, virus, uh, this, mind, mind you, this is MS-DOS days. And 
So there was one, maybe two viruses out there that I can really remember. And security wasn't something that I even thought about because everything I was building was on on a desktop. It was There was no interconnectivity or anything like that. There was just that no internet at that time. Uh, you know, and as and as I continue to uh, evolve in programming and find new opportunities, uh, there still wasn't that sense that security was a big concern. There was security within the context of networks, and you had IT admins who were clearly very vested in security, security and making sure their systems were safe. But things weren't connected. Even banks, I mean, banks had dedicated ISDN lines, and so there was. There was no sense that security, was, from an application perspective, was a big concern. Uh, you know, I spent ten years at Microsoft, and uh, and about I'm going to say about three years ago, maybe four, I had I had been leading the edge developer relations team, and so I had been talking so long about cross browser development that I really wanted to speak about something different, something that I felt developers mm. could kind of make some some choices about. And everybody had been talking about cross-browser development. I, th- I felt like, all right, this has been this is a story that's been played already. And I started digging into application security. And I thought, that's a good thing for me to hang my hat on. And I was really thinking of it within the context of, let's say, a fiscal year. This fiscal year, I'm going to talk about this within the context of web development. And it, it would be a good story. And as I dug deeper into it, I realized there, there's really a gap in terms of how developers think about security. Most of them just don't. Um, I've been working with a lot of developers over the last several years just on different things, and security was never a topic that came up. Uh, I would go to developer conferences, and there was never a topic around application security. You had some folks like Adam Baldwin, who was running the Node.js uh, security project, and he kept talking about security, but he, he, you know, he's, he's been in the business for a long time, and so he kind of saw what was happening, especially around the Node, node world. But for the most part, I don't think most people really took security as a priority within their application development lifecycle. It was like, I need to build software, I need to get it out. And yeah, I'll take some steps here to sanitize inputs wherever I can. But for the most part, security wasn't a concern. And tool chains definitely weren't part of that. There was, as far as I remember, there was no SAST or you know, SEA um, tooling or things like that. Fuzzing wasn't even a word that I, I knew until I got into security. So it was kind of a jarring thing. And, and the big thing for me that kind of uh, really made me shift and say, I want to go into security full-time uh, when, was when NotPetya hit. And then WannaCry subsequently after that. And WannaCry was kind of jarring because it, it, you know, it locked out the national healthcare system in the UK. And patients were being turned away for things like cancer treatment and dialysis. And that was a big deal. I was like, I, what if this was my family? And I've talked about this before, and it, it still rings true even to this day that, God, what, what if this was one of my children? And what would I do if they couldn't get care because some miscreant th- decided that they wanted to lock up a, a system, a hospital system? So I decided to switch over to security. I decided to invest my time and switch careers into helping build more secure systems, whether it's on the network level or in this case now, looking more at the application stack and figuring out how do we help developers build more secure software? Yeah, and I think part of how do we help them develop is that uh, one of the tenets or one, one of the common themes of recent years as we talk about DevOps, ex- for example, is that shifting responsibility onto developers. So it's not so much even that they, uh, may- maybe they, it doesn't have to be foremost on their mind, uh, but mm-hmm. if the security orgs are thinking, well, we need you to be more responsible for this, that's got to be a, a shift of some sort. And one of the things that stood out to me as you were talking just now is where are the developers talking about this or not talking about this for that matter and developer conferences that's actually kind of different i think than you know in possibly a better way as we start to shift into this conversation to thinking about how do we get developers thinking about security how many developers do we get coming to a security conference to hear another talk on xss categorization or csrf attacks versus Mm -hmm. bringing a security person over to a developer conference it seems to me like going into dev conferences might be the that theme of let's go find out where the developers are and talk to them there that's a great point and i like something that you said you said uh, how do we get developers to think about security and there's something I really want to stress here. I don't think developers need to be security experts. Uh, and that's, 
That's something that I think is a scary proposition for a lot of folks who've made a, uh, an investment in becoming a software developer. They Security is hard. And it's as hard as any programming that I've done in the past. And it's it's a big challenge. And not everybody wants to do that. And not everybody should do it. So I like the fact that you said we need to get them to think about security. And that's the stepping stone. And you're absolutely right. I think uh, security companies in general need to go to the developer watering holes. They need to make greater inroads into the developer communities. They need to speak with developers uh, face-to-face. They need to... Uh, I one of my sayings, and I use this over and over, and people are probably sick of hearing it from me. Is like I like to shake hands and kiss babies, and what I mean by that is that I like to be boots on the ground at an event. I like to sit down with attendees, whoever it is, some random person, and just get to know them and have conversations because that's how you get to know what's on their mind. It's really hard virtually sometimes to do that. Uh, so to me, when I'm able to do it in person, it's great. Unfortunately, now with COVID, it's been a real challenge. So uh, thankfully. Podcasts like this, um, Twitch streams, videos, video conferences have really opened up this capability. So we definitely now need to start looking at how do we get to the developer conferences and come up with topics that relate to what developers really want to hear. If you just go in there and say, and say hey, I'm going to do a talk about cross-site scripting or you know, SQL injection and blah, 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 and you just go in with these really esoteric security terms, you're going to turn people off. You have to Type come up with zero topics. cross-site scripting. It's so exciting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so you have to come up with topics that that developers can relate to. And a lot of that has to do with how do you how do you relate to them at the programming language level? How do you relate to them at the business value level? How do you relate to them at the deployment level? Things that matter to them and then incorporate security into that conversation in some way. One of the things that I see a lot is um it, it are, is and this has kind of been spinning up lately is a lot of talks related to let's take i don't know uh juice shop and let's show all these vulnerabilities that can happen but that's great the problem is that you only have a short amount of time with your developer audience to really drive a point home you can say all these things are vulnerable but at the end of the day these developers are probably going to say wow yeah they're vulnerable and then they're going to go back and go back to their day jobs and forget exactly what you talked about. But if you right. narrow down that scope a little bit and really focus more on bite-sized chunks of things that could directly impact their workflow and impact their customers in some fashion, uh, maybe it is just focusing on cross-site scripting. Maybe it is just focusing on SQL injection uh, but and give a real world scenario where they can relate to and then give them remediation options. I think that's where you're going to get value. That's where they're going to start saying, Oh, I understand why I need to sanitize inputs. Oh, I need to I didn't know I needed to sanitize XML. Oh, and so you can compliment Jushop. You can point them to Jushop if you want to, but I don't think Jushop should be the central focus of a conference presentation because it's just too short of a time and the audience is gonna get they're they're just gonna get lost. So they're, yeah, they're going to get lost, and yeah, and they're going to lose that. Make it relevant to them is is, is what you're saying. Why, why why show them Juice Shop if you're talking mm-hmm. about some you know developers working on iOS and Android code, um, you know, shift it into the just the API focused aspects. And right. think, even w- even today, mm-hmm. like we today was an, there was an announcement about a composer supply chain attack, and I don't know all the details yet about it. I'm still digging into that, but it'd be interesting to to say, look, this is how a supply chain attack looks like, and let's break down what this composer uh, and packages uh, supply chain attack looks like. And you break it down soup to nuts. And then you say, this is how it could impact you as a PHP developer. And you've brought in this code and this is what happens. And then this is how you remediate it. But you've narrowed down the scope. You've narrowed it down to your specific audience. Let's say in this case, might've been PHP developers. And you're, you're bringing it up with a tool that's really, really critical to their success. And then you show them, this is how you solve the problem. And once you do that, I think developers will start taking an interest. Again, it doesn't mean they're going to be security experts and they I don't think they're going to want to, but you're going to get at least their interest and you're going to make them think more critically about things like ingesting third-party code without truly understanding what the implications are. 
Yeah, and I think the the direction we're going here is talking about security training. And we haven't mentioned it yet, but the idea I'm you know, going to bring us around to security champions as well. Because one of the things you're describing is that one-to-many relationship. You know, here is a security person explaining mm-hmm. some security topics, some, something that's relevant, a, a, a suite of, of remediation steps that are actually relevant to the code they're writing as well. So we're talking about Java. Let's have some Java solutions rather than PHP examples and PHP solutions. But one of the things that comes hard, you know, as, as I see it in training and in champions is that it's still kind of people focused, which makes it hard to scale and to a degree, perhaps hard to do well in the long term. I've seen mm-hmm. various successful and for that matter, unsuccessful security champions programs. And it's one of those things that I have a feeling that a lot of people think they want or really want, but don't necessarily realize how to make it successful to so that it lasts more than six months or so. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, how have you seen either training or champions programs work? And, and what are some good ways to think about that just in the sense of this is something that'll last for a long time? Sure. Security champions is such a, um, it, it's it's a term that is really picking up steam nowadays. Uh, I And I know it goes back for quite some time, but uh, I've seen uh, a dramatic uptick now in terms of that term being used to define way, like almost like a solution to application security. I see it as one part of the application security uh, solution. So having people who are who develop a, an understanding and develop a passion for security is great. And if you can culture that, I mean, nurture that, definitely do it. And those people will self-select. What will end up happening is um, as you offer more security training, uh, for example, like Barracode has security labs. And if you go there and you take the, the, the training and those, all of a sudden that person becomes like this, this advocate for security, you know that you have somebody on your hands that you want to nurture. You want to, you want to get them more training. Why? Because the bulk of your team is probably not going to be interested in that, that level of security. But if you can get this person who can be the bridge between your business stakeholders, the security team themselves, uh, and the development team, and they can kind of be the translator between all these different units. That's huge. That's a huge way of making sure that your projects are on track it, because now everybody's particular priorities are kind of uh, understood. I, at least I feel that way. In the security champions programs that I've seen that are effective, these people tend to be really good communicators. They definitely understand the security landscape. They're not, I won't say they're like super AppSec experts. They just understand security. They understand the importance of it, but they also really deeply understand the development side of that. And then they have a good way of communicating with the IT security people who have a super important job. I, I want to stress this to all developers that the network security folks, the what we call IT admins, they have an incredibly important job. They're there to protect you and the company, sensitive data. Their job is incredibly hard. And the saying goes that you know, an attacker only needs to be right once while a defender needs to be right 100% of the time. And if you've ever wanted to see stress, work in a you know, security operations center and see the stress that a lot of these defenders are, are under every single day. Their job is critical. And so I'm guilty of kind of thinking security is their job. Why do I have to focus on it? And it's not. It's a responsibility across the board. We all need to think about it. And I guess I'm in that privileged position now where I've switched over to security. And I'm seeing it from the other side of the fence. So if you have a security champion that can understand the needs of the security professionals on the IT side, and then also understand the business needs and kind of bring everybody together, that's where you're going to succeed. But you have to get them training and the training has to be continuously reinforced. It's not like, let's just send somebody out to a week of training and then they come back from that week and they still have a boatload of of work to do and everything they learn just goes out the door. You can't because practice makes permanent. That's the bottom line. If you go to a training class and you come back and you just just don't practice what you've just learned during that week... I can guarantee you will not remember it. It's just not going to happen. And I, I know that because I'm talking from experience. I've gone to a training class, spent six days doing a training, and I haven't used what they taught me. And I can't remember a lot of the things that I was taught, which is sad. 
if we're making that investment, especially when it comes to several thousands of dollars, let's make sure that even if it's one person, that person you feel that might be the security champion, let's make sure that they have ample time, whether it's their 20% or whether it's 50%, they have time to actually implement some of the things they learned and then also so, give them time to mentor other people. Yeah. And you've, so you're setting up a great explanation about the importance of investing to support the a champions program itself. One of the things that stood out is, is you were describing a little bit of kind of the responsibilities of that champion. Uh, I didn't hear, for example, a, any mention of they're going to be doing the code reviews all the time, secure code reviews. They're mm-hmm. going to be the ones doing threat modeling all the time. I heard communication. Uh, between security, so translating security issues, security concepts to the developer team, as well as business context. In, in that sense that I'm going to you know, expand on what you were kind of getting to there, but that idea that someone who understands the, 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 the context, this is what we're building, and this is on the side of threat modeling, what could go wrong that is specific to our application. So we're going beyond just the basics of OWASP Top 10 about, sure, there's an inje- injection problem that could happen here, cross-site scripting over here. That's just generic cruft. It's more about, ah, yeah. oh, these are some security boundaries we're here. If somebody grabbed this particular token, that would be game over. If somebody, we, we have this other assumption in this feature that's that a person has done these three steps in this workflow. But if you skipped two of those steps and got here, bad things can happen. So that's what I hear as well about the important uh, capabilities of what this security champion is doing as you're describing it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, Mike. The way I look at it is that I think if you're in a very mature organization, the, the likelihood of you having security champions with that level of knowledge is substantially higher. I try to think of it a little bit broader where you're dealing with like small to medium-sized businesses as well, where they may not have this, this very mature model and they need to learn. And so going back to your, what your topic about you know, getting training and education, I think this goes hand in hand with having people on site who can kind of nurture the security champion to a level where things like code reviews are just part of their day-to-day job, where threat modeling is something that they actually learn. Remember, developers don't have that as a normal skill. It's not taught in any any type of computer science course. Uh, Security in general is very anemic at the university level. You'll talk to professors and they'll tell you that, yeah, we have some courses here and there that kind of reinforce security best practices, but they're usually at the graduate level. So if you go into a, an undergraduate program, you're going to learn the fundamentals of computer science. You're going to come out of there being uh, you know, a pretty okay programmer, you're still not business savvy, but you, know, you, you, you could probably hack some good stuff out. But in terms of the security side, that's where you're going to be lacking. And that continues on into the corporate world where secu- you, you know, security and development in many respects are viewed as cost centers. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that level of investment is substantially lower uh, unless there is something that becomes a critical priority uh, for senior leadership. Uh, and, and so you need to have somebody who is willing to make the investment in teaching security to your development team. You need to identify the people who want to self-select into becoming security champions. And then you have to further their education to the point where they can feel comfortable doing those code reviews and they can feel comfortable doing things like threat modeling. And also, you need to give empower them to have those conversations with the security folks, the network security folks, the infrastructure folks. So that way they understand what does security actually look like. In many respects, it's probably good for the development team and the secure and the network administration teams to have regular stand-ups and have conversations about what's important to them, what are the priorities. That's just to me, that just seems like normal, that should be normal monthly occurrences where. Everybody's just getting together to talk about the priorities and how those priorities fit into everybody else's grand plans. Because if you work in silos, it doesn't really make a difference whether you have a security champion or not. Bottom line is nobody knows what everybody else is talking about. So I think there there has to be some education capabilities and, of course, some uh, empowerment to make uh, security decisions across the board. So what have you seen there? Oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. Um, that's interesting. And I'm, I, I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I'm sort of, I, I want to, I'm going to try and let's take this in a slightly different direction. Um, Go for it. Or within the same direction, but what, to what you're just saying, the way you're describing it, that's the way, I think that's the way I used to think. 
Um, and I don't think the shift here I'm about to make is is significantly huge, but I'm really curious to see what your take on it is, um, especially with your employer. Uh, should we be <laughs> just purely offering education and trying to train these people and put, you know, I've done the, like, I know you have to put them, you know, 30, 60 coders into a room and spend the next two days talking about OWASP top 10, or do we try to meet them on their turf? Um, and by what I'm thinking about that is, um, you know, in a classroom, you're not, that that's not your native um, environment, right? They're used to being at a mm -hmm. keyboard with an IDE and that type of yeah. thing with an assignment. So do we, do we, where does tooling fit in? So this is where I'm going. Yeah. How can we do we have to teach them every single thing in top in top ten and as you were saying how to do uh, input sanitization all those type of things? Yeah. Or do we provide them tools that sort of helps point out that or maybe even fixes it along the way or catches a, you know, does a scan at check in or what's your thoughts around sort of that that side of things? No, that's a great question, John. And one of the things you'll know about me, and I just so you'll know, and I think I I, I work really hard at this is being Trying to be as genuine and authentic as possible. So as much as I love Veracode and yeah, I can talk about their products and stuff like that. I try to be very cautious about that because I don't want anybody to feel like yep. this is a Veracode commercial. Uh, I, I do believe way, tooling. I yeah. I, I, tooling is very important and it is to me a, a massive compliment to developer workflows. I mean, uh, it's it's a way of helping developers kind of bridge that security, that lack of security knowledge that they have. And especially for those developers that don't want to be security experts, when you have good to, good security tooling inside your pipeline, you know you have good static analysis tool, good software composition analysis tools, things that help you kind of identify common vulnerabilities or com bad patterns, uh, patterns that are known in the industry to uh, lead to security issues. They're going to make your development substantially easier in the long run. You know, initially, and I've talked to a lot of customers uh, at Veracode. Is initially there's pain because what ends up happening is when you first launch this, you know, these tools, probably you're probably going to find a lot of stuff. And then you have to work to kind of prioritize what the what those things are. Are they pri zero? Are they pri one, pri two, pri three? How does it impact your business? How does it impact business continuity? Are they things that need to be addressed immediately? And a lot of times it's going to be really bad things that you need to address immediately. But once you get into the rhythm of things and you get into the rhythm of, of normal scanning and addressing these as part of the traditional QA cycle, it just becomes part of your day-to-day -day work. And, and one of the things that Chris Ang mentioned to me, which really stuck, is that I, I start to wonder if security should just be considered bugs. I mean, yeah, there's no software developer I've ever met that wants to purposely ship bugs. And every time... I've met a developer who has shipped a bug. There's either there's two reactions. Either like they're like, oh crap, I shipped a bug, or they're like, oh god, I shipped a bug. I have to fix that. Nobody loves to fix bugs, but ultimately they know that it's just part of their normal development workflow. So maybe we need to think of security uh, issues as just bugs. And when we find them, they're just part of the QA cycle, and we have to go back and fix them. And, and then we also have to make a determination: do they break the build or not? I that's 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 a company decision more than let's say a tool vendor decision or a community decision, that's really up to the company's um, appetite for that type of stuff and what their goals are. But no, I don't think education is the only solution to this. I think education is critically important to helping certain people help guide the company and help guide their developer groups down a secure path. And you know, like Mike mentioned, uh, having people who can do code reviews and you know, um, threat modeling and and understand what security actually means is that's great, and that's where education definitely comes in. And then when you complement that with really solid tools in their CI and CD pipeline, that I mean, I think you have a great virtuous cycle there. Yeah, I think I wanted to to poke around some more on that aspect of tooling because to my mind, that's how we hit that uh, aspect of scaling. Because once you start getting into, uh, I'm going to say a few million, what even before a million lines of code, mm -hmm. that's pretty complex code base. And especially mm -hmm. in the whether you're in the modern day of microservices and you have a whole bunch mm -hmm. of different repos or one massive mono repo that you're dealing with, there's a mm -hmm. lot of benefit that comes out of having tools. And uh, mm -hmm. to riff on that aspect where you said that security is part of the QA process. One of the things I love about fuzzing is that 
99 times out of 100, a, a fuzzer is going to find a bug that's just a bug. That That's something, you know, a, the, it caused a stack dump. There, there's something bad that happened there, so it should be fixed. The uh, the catch here is figuring out priorities. And I think that maybe comes back a little bit to that conversation you were saying too about security champion. How do we prioritize this bug? Or should we just say all these security bugs are equal and they have to be fixed? Because I kind of tend to fall into the camp that a lot of security bugs are just kind of cruft that we could ignore. And sure, they were found by a tool, but it's never going to be exploitable or it doesn't have, you know, it's not part of a code path that's actually executed. Or it's honestly just not as important as some of the other priorities that might actually be for feature sets needed by right. the application or something that's more fundamental for an improvement within a, um, a software stack. Yep, agreed. And and I, I just I think tools will definitely help you I, uh, with identifying some of those things. There's there's always going to be a certain level of false positives, um, maybe even false negatives. Yeah. But the bottom line is you do, what you don't want is to have that situation where it is a real thing and you just haven't identified it right. and you have no visibility into it. And it goes even back into network security. How many times have you heard of uh, companies who were compromised because they didn't have visibility into a machine that had been sitting in their network for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, and nobody even knew about it. And it's just sitting there connecting to the internet. Nobody knew about it, but a threat actor found it. And so having visibility into what the vulnerabilities are in the threat landscape of your applications, uh, that's, that's an important thing. And hopefully some of these applications, these services that are out there, um, you know, static analysis, software composition analysis, those types of services can help out. Yeah, I think I, I want to riff off that as well, because you mentioned too, you know, attackers only need to be right once and defenders need to be right 100% of the time. But if you have good visibility, you know, great monitoring logs that are generated by events that are either fraudulent or, you know, things that shouldn't happen, uh, that kind of switches that equation into the sense that attackers need to be quiet 100% of the time and developers just need to be you know, alerted 10% of the time or I might have messed that up a little bit but I think you see where I'm yeah. going is that yeah. you know you can push that so that attackers actually have to be a lot more careful because they're going to trip those alerts and trip that that monitoring that's been set up within the application itself yep that's a great that's a great thought and and I have to say I haven't really I haven't given that thought in terms of the application space and again this goes back to me constantly learning about security. And this, I guess, reinforces that whole notion of having people in the developer space get more in tune with what security actually entails. So I'm glad you brought that up. You know, you having good security is great and having good monitoring is great. I, I'm going to, there's two things I'm going to say. First of all, I, I think most small to business, medium-sized businesses just don't have the level of maturity. I, I've seen this from data at Microsoft that they just don't have the level of security maturity that even if they have monitoring that they could catch uh, a bad actor. It's not, not a failing of any of the software. It's just it, it, security involves so many moving parts that if you can't interpret the results of, I don't know, let's say a good SIM or a good web application firewall or you know how your CASB system is working, if you can't understand what, what, what all these things are doing, it's really hard to find the threat actor. And um, it just makes it very easy for somebody to start shifting into your networks. And, and you might not even ex you know, figure that out. And then on the application side, it's, it's, it becomes even harder because I don't think the, I haven't seen the monitoring capabilities and bear with me because I'm still very, still very new to the application monitoring capabilities. I'm not sure what's all, everything that's out there. But I know that network monitoring is much more mature. And so I, I don't know how that monitoring would play into the application space. I will say that as developers, we need to be much more conscious of this. And whether it's uh, canaries in our code that can kind of flag things, uh, we, we need to consider it because as more companies start shifting into the cloud and cloud infrastructure is inherent become inherently more resilient to the traditional network based attacks. The, the application space is where threat actors are going to look at. They're going to they're going to poke around in your application. They're going to try to find the holes. Um, I've taken a lot of offensive security courses, and so I know how threat actors think. 
And it, it, it always floors me how uh, a small web shell can do a boatload of damage. It just, <laughs> you know, one line of PHP code, that's all I need. And guess what? I have, I have the ability to launch commands on a web server. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's crazy scary. So it's crazy scary. And uh, a lot of point, times it points out too, you don't ne even necessarily need root to cause damage. You just need access mm -hmm. to data, access to credentials, uh, right. those types of things. And you also need access to perhaps some good training or some conversations about application security, which is uh, what, what we had a great chance to have you on and talk with us about, Ray. So, <laughs> and, and I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, this, this is an important topic to me. I'm, one of the things I'm most grateful about is the fact that I feel reinvigorated about learning security. Um, I, I tinkered with security many, many, many moons ago when I was, you know, we're talking like uh, Slackware Linux, and and then I kind of gave up on it. Didn't think it was a big thing, big thing, but it always kind of piqued my interest. And then now I'm in it, and it's kind of reinvigorated my desire to get better at coding, understand better coding practices, and just just be a good secure. A uh, good security practitioner. Well, that's great. As and especially coming out of the you know browser development, uh, that's quite a rich area of vulnerabilities and security concerns. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see that you've come over to uh, to our side to learn more about security to bring it back to developers. So thanks once again. Also no want to thank John for joining us. Thank everyone for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Vericode, visit securityweekly.com/vericode. We're going to take a quick break and return with news of the week. Security teams need visibility into Linux systems to detect and investigate incidents and protect against unwanted activity. Operations teams are not down with downtime, and with revenue tied to uptime, ops priorities are enterprise priorities. Which is a higher priority? Why not both? Capsulate provides flexible, production-ready infrastructure protection for Linux systems, all without a kernel module. With ops-friendly production security, Capsulate delivers monitoring, detection, and response without adding operational risk or cost. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Capsulate today to request a demo. Are you looking for a solution to protect your web apps against the most business-critical security vulnerabilities? Unleash the power of automated ethical hacker knowledge with Detectify for continuous coverage and relevant security vulnerability findings. Upgrade your web app security with speed and scale and start a two-week free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash Detectify. Go hack yourself. When it comes to web app and API security, the choice is simple. You can choose Fastly's security solution that teams will actually use in full blocking mode, just like 90% of their customers. Or you can stick with costly options that you probably just turn off. You can get Fastly's all-in-one platform that protects apps everywhere they live, however they're built. Or departments can agree to disagree. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly to learn more. Or you can just wish you had. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by John Kinsella. Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference 2021 All Access Pass. RSA Conference will be a virtual but fully operational experience from May 17th to 20th. Security Weekly, including us, will be live streaming Monday through Thursday on the virtual broadcast alley, interviewing some of the top sponsors and speakers for the event. To register with our discount code, visit securityweekly.com slash RSAC2021 and use the code 5U1Cyber. We hope to see you there. Do you want to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly? Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher or our YouTube channel, sign up for our mailing list, join our nice and active Discord server right now, and follow us on our newest live streaming platform, Twitch. Hello, subs. And that, John, brings us to the news of the week. Well, before we go on to what's happened in, in new vulns and new fun research, uh, let's do a quick follow-up on uh, the Linux kernel deception vulns and University of Minnesota. So um, I think that, or I know that you've read a little bit more details about what the uh, the, the, the emails that, that were going back and forth about this whole situation and University of uh, Minnesota re uh, released a response and apology for that matter to this. Uh, before we go into what their apology looked like, I just want to throw it over to you, just some, some additional thoughts and background here if you want to uh, dive in on this. How about, um, wow, they really <laughs> screwed up. Uh, no, oh uh, well, obviously, yes, but yeah, man, uh, we were talking off air about this uh, 
I, I dug through a lot of the, the kernel mailing lists, the threads on this after the show last week. Um, and yeah, it, in all sorts of directions. I mean, there's there's a few guys that were looking at, okay, let's find all commit shaws from the university for the last six months a year and, and just go ahead and remove those from the Linux kernel source because we don't know what's real, what's not. The developers weren't being clear about what actually, where they did their stuff. That it's, you're caught, just come on, stop with the games. Um, and then there was one or two, there was at least one post in there where Greg KH like called him out straight out, said like, look, we know you're doing this. You've done it before. And they're like, no, this was just a, a patch. We were just submitting to try and be nice. And it's like, you've lost all, um, unfortunately respect and trust. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, and then we have this article, which, which you posted, Mike, where, you know, it's, it's, um, when something it's one thing if it's a single commit, but when it's been going on for a while and it's not clear how long it's been going on and no one's really being super forthcoming with the details in a, um, a, a pretty quick manner, because it's been going on for, what, two weeks now, I think? Um, it, it's really an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, and then you think about things like where do those, where are those guys going to work after they graduate, if they graduate? Um, is the university going to have less people going there for CS? Uh, it, it, it's a really big deal. So um, I, I hope they clean it up quickly and, and be very transparent about it. Yeah, there's definitely some reputational impacts that we've seen on, on the research side. And the two things that stood out to me, what I, I liked about you know the, their acknowledgement, the, the university's uh, apology, was that, one, they called out that you know, they, they didn't really engage the kernel community to help set up a p- good protocol for doing this. Now, obviously, it's a deception study, but you can go about with you could have a trusted cohort or some some ways of setting this up so that it wouldn't be a complete surprise nor such a difficult cleanup afterwards saying that here are the explicit shaw commits that were intended to be introduced some vulnerabilities and these are the ones that are completely unrelated to us so a lot of just weak design there and i think too the other reason they're pulling this out is that even though that the security community i don't think is going to be surprised i for one wasn't too surprised that someone could attempt to introduce uh, some vulnerabilities intentionally into source code one of the things though is that that i liked about the pushback and liked about the results here is that don't want this type Type of research to become a model for as for a lot of now security conference presentations or just people kind of beating the dead horse if you will re- recreating this type of effort that ultimately just became a waste of time on the kernel maintainer side of things without necessarily or I think without at all showing something that was a new threat model or introducing something that would could lead to some meaningful changes in process or changes in the way that we're uh, looking at these types of scale of code commits. And this is where my mind goes to things like just having better default compiler settings, as we were just talking about with with Ray. How, how can your tools help you? The you know, LLVM's uh, address sanitizer, undefined behavior sanitizer, those are great starts. Additional fuzzing can be great starts. And just figuring out what are better ways we can have automation that are helping us to do that trust but verify, if you will, from committers who are sending in patches in good faith. So I think yeah. thought it was uh, and I think, some, some good follow-ups there. Oh, go ahead. The, there's definitely, it's not just the, um, it's not just the, uh, um, the tooling side of things, right? That That's definitely going to yeah. help and capture a lot of this type of stuff. But um, I meant to just message you privately and I didn't, but I sent a, a pull request. We, we screwed up something on a, um, one of our releases. Actually, I screwed up something. Um, our build broke, but we'd already tagged the release. So the release got released on GitHub. Uh-huh. Um, uh, one of the upstream package providers, I won't name names for now, but they went ahead and took that. And then I sent them a pull request to get them the correct SHA in their checksums. And as far as I know, they took my pull request without verifying who I was. So what I'm saying is that level of social engineering yeah. are, you know, uh, um, trust and verify that it's, there's still something to be done around that, but, you know, research, study, help, but it has to be done in an ethical manner. 
It does. And, and that's a great point because it's the idea of, I, that comes back to identity for sure in the sense of signed commits who has authority to make these types of changes because you could also have, uh, go back to the idea of uh, HSTS or H, uh, PKP, public key pinning within browsers. It mm -hmm. would be pretty wonderful denial of service against a, uh, against a website if you were able to convince a browser vendor to to pin a certificate to a certificate, you know, an intermediate cert that the that an app isn't using at all. Uh, so obviously we haven't seen that happen, and there are some good safeguards I put in, in place to do so. But I think it mostly relies on uh, webs of trust in the sense of who can vouch for who within this ecosystem, uh, which doesn't necessarily say who has the authority to say, oh, use this SHA versus this other SHA. So that's a great example. And I just jog my memory about other, other ways that could come up within this type of um, committing code ecosystem. Yeah. And to be really clear on that, they might have they might have done a little bit of background on me and figure out who I was. But as far as I know, yeah. they, they, was, it, they just took it. So. Well, hopefully anyway. they've been hanging out on a Discord channel and paying attention to ASW, and they, they know the expertise that comes from Mr. John Kinsella. <laughs> John, we'd also love some of your expertise as we talk about some of the more recent news of this week. One uh, that was pretty cool to me was Bad Alec. So this is from Microsoft, and they're pretty much showing that uh, here are some examples of very well-known Alloc, you know, basically memory-based uh, C functions that have gone haywire, or just basically off by one. Uh, heap overflows, un underflows, overflows, really simple things. Uh, but what they found were a lot of vulnerabilities within some real-time operating systems and in some SDKs that are used within not so much IoT, like retail IoT, but in industrial control systems, in operational technology, which is more of a an umbrella for that combination of here is a big device, a big engine that has some embedded code running in it that's part of a manufacturing process or something you know pretty consequential like that. And it just so happens to have a pretty vanilla basic memory misuse, memory allocation vulnerability. So a little bit disappointing that these these types of vulns still are around, but pretty cool to see this research, pretty cool to see the research shared. And actually one of my questions here would be an outstanding question for the Microsoft team is, what was their methodology for finding this? Did they actually have some fuzzers and some tooling helping them with this in their Area 52, or sorry, their their what they call themselves, uh, Region 52 uh, re research Section group? 52, yeah. Section 52, thank you. Um, or was this pure, once again, just manual inspection and code review poking around at some uh, suspicious areas? I presume it has to be some level of automation, but... It, and you know what was interesting, what this made me think of, uh, back to, to thinking of talking about Discord again. So um, some of our listeners actually talk on Discord when we're not live on the air, and sometimes I'm trying to get into more <laughs> myself. But someone mentioned on there... Um, last week it was actually a conversation or a blog post around SBOM um, mm. and the idea of SBOM and, and OT um, and should as you know the idea is should a vendor be publishing their SBOM so even if they don't patch something people at least know that that's in that product um, and that they're, they're sort of slightly hinting at that here too I'm not sure how I feel about that to be honest as a vendor I don't know if I'd want to publish my SBOM I need to think about that more um, I mean, we obviously do it on open source, but it, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see them on this. Um, and I think we're going to talk, I'll bring up Mark, Microsoft again later in one of our other articles, but um, mm -hmm. I think it was related to something else as well, but yeah, interesting. Interesting. And uh, it's interesting, too, to talk about that, that SBOM, because SBOM clearly is a, a, of importance to the IoT world, especially on the retail side, but I think possibly more importantly, too, from this industrial side as well, just about what is built and how fragile might something be. And I understand a little bit what's getting at in the sense of, do we want to publish an SBOM for all of us to see what version we're on, especially if that version has known vulnerabilities? I tend to fall on the side that that doesn't really matter because just publishing the SBOM 
doesn't make it any more difficult or any easier for for an attacker to simply scan and try to deliver that vulnerability anyway um, through through a, like a spray and pray so, sort of attack, so to speak. But that can be kind of loud. But it also, to me, just seems that it's more just opening up the aspect of here's what we have. And how quickly can we patch? Because even if we were quiet on the SBOM, patches can come out. We've seen a lot of uh, hist historical evidence that researchers are, or attackers are reverse engineering binary patches to figure out what the vulnerability was in the first place, be able to go poke around at that, and even find alternate um, executions, uh, variants is what the word I'm looking for on these vulnerabilities. So some cool stuff to think of. It's great thing, you know, great thing to bring up. Talking about SBOM and and how uh, what what are some implications around that that might be around that from a security perspective. So uh, we'll definitely have to come back to think about that some more. And um, please uh, send us, you know, listeners, send us some more information around there. Some other. Uh, in, blog posts or tool tooling around that because uh, i think there, there's some more we could talk about and i'll um inject really quickly uh the i think the other microsoft thing i was thinking about might have actually been related ah. to this uh which was there was something which came out last week which they found uh when they were doing R D on their sphere stuff so I, this sounds close enough that i suspect they're the two mm -hmm. the same thing so Likely, that's how they i think it. they're probably fuzzing for that now yeah, probably. They, 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 you find one instance of a bug in, in one spot in your own code, for example, and you're like, cool, we have some, we at least have a, a capability to find this in one place. Why don't we go poke around and see if there's, oops, 25 other places where this similar type of bug exists. And I will say, now, obviously, this was a Microsoft research, and um, they, they, they did, so they, they did say that the, the Microsoft Azure RTOS thread X is not vulnerable to a lot of what they were uh, highlighting here. It's not vulnerable in its default configuration. So I will say, you know, perhaps that's just a little bit of Microsoft, uh, you know, um, doing a bit of subtle or not too subtle marketing on their own operating system yeah. there. But I will say, to me at least, it's nice to see that a default configuration wasn't vulnerable. And I think setting aside a little bit of the, we're happy we weren't as bad off here, but more so of what can we do just better about defaults? Because especially within ICS, OT, defaults are probably what's going to be most prevalent and why not start with these more secure baseline rather than saying here's our rtos and here's our 20 page checklist to in order to deploy it securely let's drop that down into a one or two checklist point checklist and have those defaults to start off in a much better situation but we've possibly destroyed that article quite a bit. Let's shift from real quick uh, from uh, Windows or from actually from Microsoft over to Mac OS. Here was a pretty cool vulnerability in the Mac OS Gatekeeper. Now, I want to preface this with the idea that there, let's make sure that we keep some threat modeling in, in perspective here. So this isn't a remote execution type of the world is falling because of Mac OS Gatekeeper bypass, but it is pretty cool that it, this is a part of call it user assisted malware or essentially a phishing campaign or something that would have some pretext to say oh john by the way please double click what you've just downloaded here now normally what gatekeeper is designed to do is pop up an alert that says you double clicked on this are you sure you want to execute this item that you just downloaded from the from the web and in other cases actually it's actually going to block you from executing that um at all, just because of the, the way that macOS has quarantined certain applications when they're downloaded. And the two articles I, that I linked to here have some really good technical details on this that are pretty gnarly to get into. But what was really neat to me is that as much as we talk about shifting to Rust, shifting to Go, shifting to a lot of other languages, uh, I'm still going to beat or, or stand on my soapbox that we're going to be dealing with logic and, and implementation types of errors. And this is a great example of an implementation error in logic that that's sort of an oops here is a script based application that just so happens to be missing an info.plist file that normally would classify this as a bundle which gatekeeper would say oops i need to make sure i have some quarantine some alerts that fire when you do this but if that one file is missing then you can bypass all of that and it's just going to execute so 
pretty cool. Um, pretty great write-ups from Patrick Wardle, someone who's pretty well known in the the Mac OS uh, reverse engineering community. So if you want to l- yeah. read some more about reverse engineering, check out those articles. Great technical write-ups. And um, I might have it's exhausted amazing. all there's there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and it was pretty amazing that this existed out there in the wild for so long without someone realizing. I mean, this is yes. It, it it yeah, it's sort of shocking, but keep going. You've said enough. <laughs> um, well, y- you gave me some time to think of a good segue, but I still I still failed on a good segue. So I'm just going to say now we're going to talk about two authentication related issues. Now these are two articles that mostly related to to Kerbero, so a KDC spoofing and an Active Directory. Um, uh, flaws. And now this is a little bit of a callback to some conversations we had about authentication vulnerabilities that we saw in SAML and OpenID and OAuth, etc. What I was, what, the reason I brought these in again is that these two articles have, once again, pretty nice write-up. They're demonstrating some ways that vulnerabilities are actively exploited by attackers. Uh, so that's also can be helpful to inform. And the articles themselves just give a good background on what is Kerberos. Uh, so you can learn some basics of the protocol, just understanding some some fundamentals of how do we authenticate and authorize activities between services. Also, just as an aside, has some one, the article from um, uh, from Silverfort uh, had a nice call out to the history of KDC Kerberos uh, spoofing in, in this area, of, all the way back to uh, some work from Doug Song back in 2000. So it's just nice to see that uh, there's some some context here that these ne- aren't necessarily new volumes. So with that bit of preamble aside, I brought these out as more of an aspect of how would you take the principles here, the concepts here in terms of spoofing responses back to the KDC that says, oh yeah, I do have a token, or I've obtained the the certificate that's used to sign trust relationships, and I'm using that throughout my cloud deployment. So these are still concepts that I think can be pretty applicable to AWS, to GCP, in the sense of how are you protecting your tokens? How are you enforcing least privileges within your IAM setup? So I think there's some ways to take these as sort of a pre-mortem, if you will, or just a way to set up some conversations about threat modeling with your developers and the complexity within cloud deployments. So that, that, that's the angle I wanted to bring out here. Mm-hmm. And the other thing um, too is, oh, yeah, exactly. That that they, was the, um, that was the pause I tried to throw to John. Try not to catch you uh, <laughs> off guard. Oh no no no! I'm I'm paying attention. Uh, and and you know, as you mentioned about the machine and the the Amazonish bits. Yeah, we covered KDC was Curb was one of the options we covered in that uh, what five ways a few weeks ago to uh, authenticate cloud to cloud. Um, two things on this on the. Uh, um, well, one on just both. I, I can't believe people are still managing to find issues with Curb. Um, <laughs> it, it's impressive, especially two at the same time makes me wonder again if, if this was, well, maybe we're coming up to RSA, so people are, the press is getting ready, uh, PR is getting ready. But then the, on the Silver Fort one, there's a section on there about for developers, which I, I thought, you know, we're fans of that. Anytime you can sort of, you know, help help the developers directly understand what the issue is and how to improve upon it. But in particular, their uh, second point, use Wireshark. Uh, I, I, in a smaller shop, sure, yeah, or you know, a very senior developer, I, I get that. But a lot of these orgs out there, I mean, maybe if you're if they're talking about a protocol developer, then you'd you'd be there. But um, yeah. the average developer, Wireshark, mm, don't think so. No, don't think so. And that's what's interesting is I was trying to also to pull out some additional resources to help with this. And uh, one of the things actually we haven't talked about, I don't think too much here on, on the series, is the OWASP cheat sheet sh- uh, series. And mm-hmm. they do have a handful on authentication topics. There's one that's pretty good on access control. And there's another one about microservices security that talks about authentication authorization issues. So I think those are pretty good, at least to uh, look at. And if you just want a kind of a high level introduction, to some of the basics of threat modeling around session management. There is a session management cheat sheet, but um, the, the, those at least I'd nudge you towards before just installing Wireshark and looking at packets on the wire, unless, of course, you are a, a protocol developer. And um, 
I think that's what I've, I think I've exhausted my, myself on that because there's, there's some other interesting things to talk about. One is in the spirit of threat modeling. Here's an example from uh, Krebs on security talking about an Experian API that exposed credit scores of most Americans. And the, the, the flaw here came out of an API in one of their third parties, one of their partners that was exposing their own data, the Experian's data. Now, uh, th th there's a couple areas to, to open up here, but to me, it was also very much that example of, sure, we've talked, we have some security champions, in our, perhaps, in our own developer crew. We have a lot of controls around our own APIs, around our data, but then our data leaves our premises. We have, you know, goes to someone else's cloud or our API is for another API developers to consume or we've created an SDK and suddenly that sphere of influence uh, isn't quite as in depth as it could be and this is now where you get the, not quite a supply chain flaws but our third party supplier or suppliers to uh, i lost my train of thought there but uh, api security breaks down so that, that was the angle i wanted to pull out of this particular uh, article and sort of talk about it from how are others consuming our api for that matter and have we done enough to be able to figure out when they either might be abusing it or those third party apis that are one step removed from us are being abused. Yeah, I think I think there's an area we're, we're going to see there. It, there's plenty of space for improvement for at least the next eighteen months, is my guess. So we've been, you know, API security. We've talked about a few times. It's been on our minds for a few years now. I get the sense that people aren't. Um, still fully it's either they might be starting to think about more but i don't think we're actually getting the, the purchase we need on it um we, we're aware of the browser stuff and all those type of things but i still see so many orgs that are doing you know my private api versus my public api and it's like mm. dude the guy who is running wireshark the the malicious person he doesn't care if it's public or private he's still going to see it um and, and, you know, or if it's documented or not, I think that there's a lot of that type of thing going on or like, can, you know, as we move more towards this developer first shifting left, there's more consumption of third party APIs by the developers. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're going to we'll be talking about this one for a while, I think. Yeah, we will. And I think and that's a, you, you remind me another point I was going to make when we were talking about the, the all the Kerbero stuff is that in, in that particular threat model, it, you, you needed someone in a, in a privileged network position, basically meaning that you mm -hmm. needed somebody who could, you know, um, uh, inspect in, in, in traffic and be able to spoof packets. And here you're talking about, you know, is it an internal private API or is it a public API? And the point that I'm slowly getting to here is in the idea of modern cloud environments it's pretty simple if you have if you've compromised a, an instance it can suddenly be pretty simple to now be in that privileged network position to either spoof traffic or you don't even need to spoof traffic you're on that service and now you can actually interact with it just as perhaps another trusted service within that org you're you're assuming you don't even need credentials you're just injecting into a process something like that so i'm sort of my long-winded way of getting to that agreement in the sense of public versus private API, th that line probably isn't blurred so much in the modern cloud environment, especially if you have a, uh, especially depending on how much network segmentation you have uh, within your service-to-service -service communication, how that identity and, and, and authentication is working. There is uh, one final thing. Uh, I'm going to save the, the, the specter for, for last. going to switch over and rather than talk about some vulns for a bit, uh, the article that I picked up from TLDR Sec. So uh, thanks once again, Clint, for, for a good newsletter. Uh, always a good thing to find some interesting AppSec thoughts articles. This is just from Twilio that's talking about changing security tool requirements in the new DevSecOps world. So, you know, it's a, a buzzword compliant article title, if you will. Uh, but the teasing aside, uh, th it's, uh, I like this article because it's really quick read, but it really just points to that aspect of tools need to integrate into the IDEs or tools need to be usable by developers. And this goes back to a point that you had made in the last uh, segment, John, just about 
we can't we can't spend all of our time just talking about oh we're going to do more training and then we're going to do some more training and then we're going to have security champions we do need some tooling somewhere and those tools need to be helpful and if those tools are in our IDEs that's actually going to and in our in the CI CD workflow for that matter that's probably going to be a lot better than just saying, yeah, go use a security tool because it fixes everything and it's going to take up even more time to weed out the false positive, false negative, et cetera, et cetera, versus, oh, it's just part of your IDE, creates a little red squiggly line that says this code looks looks sus and um, go from there. Yeah. And it, I mean, that that's... I want to make sure we're careful with that and we don't do the sort of, you know, machine learning rainbow type thing. Um, it, yes. it's, it's a lot easier said than done, right? Uh, it's not the same as, um, I guess if I was to give an analogy, it's, it's not, it's a lot closer to a grammar checker um, mm-hmm. in a, a, say, Microsoft Word compared to a spell checker. Uh, and that, you know, those things still are you know, I won't say wrong, but uh, um, not accurate, a good, good chunk of time. So I think there's it's something I've, I've, like I said, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how do we, how do we make those, you know, how do I get to to that guy's seat and make something that what he wants to use and fits into his life cycle um, without, you know, doing the hi, I'm from security and I'm here to help that type of thing. And I think it, it it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think I've, like I've said a few times on here now recently, last few weeks, I think a lot of people have products out there saying they're shifting left, but how do you actually really shift left? How do you actually really get into that side of things? And, and, you know, what, what does that really look like in a successful way for that development team? So, yeah, this is, it's a short, it's almost too short. It's it sort of, it, by the time you realize what's yeah. going on, you've read it. Um, but still it's, it's a decent thing piece. Yeah, that's why I really wish to pull out some some more heft from there because especially coming from developers, I think to your point as well, seeing how they actually use these tools rather than telling them how they should be using those tools is a very subtle product management uh, perspective to to take. And I think you can be more successful when you're talking to developers and they say, "Yep, this is how I'm using this and this is how it looks like in in my daily basis and this is what helps me rather than, "Oh, I just need to use this tool." somebody said so um, speaking of tools and somebody said so um that's not related to the final article on uh or at least one of them uh, that i had about some more research that coming out of specter so this is looking at um micro op caches and the, reminded this kind con- this plus the initial microsoft work on bad alec reminded me that we hadn't uh, talked about some cool aerospace engineering or some aerospace flaws uh, so john i'm going to throw that over to you just as uh, some some future to to go find us some some cool involves <laughs> in that those cool industrial systems so let, let's have that i'm actually um, what, mm-hmm. I- Oh, go ahead. I say I actually I keep an eye my eye out. I, I'm still an active subscriber to uh, ours's uh, Rocket Report. I'm not seeing anything good come through, but I'm I'm looking. Excellent. So, uh, listeners, help us out. Uh, help make make sure we um throw, find some cool stuff for John to talk about. But in this case, we're talking about again going into Intel AMD processors and. This isn't a sky is falling type of article. Uh, just so that's one of the themes of the, uh, the the flaws that we've been talking about within this particular episode. But it is interesting, just in the spirit uh, that uh, just a few weeks ago we were talking from Google researchers were demonstrating Spectre proof of concept attacks within modern browsers and showing how JavaScript could be used to exploit them. And so there now has been a lot of work from uh, developers from from. Uh, kernel developers, especially low-level su- systems engineers, figuring out how can we make sure we have perf- high-performing chips that aren't leaking a lot of information that can be used to pull out secrets from these trusted processes. Now, of course, this one, this you know, you need to be executing a code on a system. I think even in this case, you have to actually be executing within the shared uh, threads uh, of uh, of the target process. So there's a lot of things that are necessary to pull off this type of attack. So, I, but I mentioned that in the sense of just saying sky is not falling. But also, I do want to acknowledge that this is some pretty cool reading. And uh, if you're interested in Spectre, interested in side channels, there's a lot of 
clever places to be able to look and say, here is what a here here is a way of inferring what's going on within a CPU. So uh, some some CPU gearheads out there would love to read about it, dive in uh, to these this article. But um, I think that's going to exhaust the the level of detail that I'm going to be able to comfortably explain for our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> These ones always <laughs> seem to come out on Friday afternoons, and this one hit me on a Friday afternoon, and um, yes. so yeah, that that's how I wrapped up last week. Um, y- you know, and I'm, I'm happy we are actually ending on this article because this comes right back to where we started with Ray talking about, um, you know, all these all these things we have in in.